Disclaimer! The following episode contains spoilers for Solo, a Star Wars story. Don't go crying to your mum if we spoil it for you. You've been warned! Welcome to Podcapers, the official podcast of a place to hang your cape. And this week, never tell me the odds, because I don't understand how odds work. We're talking about Solo! Cue the music! Hello there, capers, and as I said, welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast of a place to hang your cape. My name is Scott James Meridue, and this is the show where we talk about various geek and nerd related topics, and are joined each week by a very special guest. Now, I'm joined by multiple guests this week. Capers, give it up for Kaylee, Matt, and Christian from the Deleted Scene Podcast. Can you give it up for ourselves? Do we have to give it up for each other? Yes. So I give it up for Christian and Kaylee. Kaylee gives it up for you and me. No, you give it up for me. I'll give it up for Kaylee and Kaylee give it up for you. So we do it in a triangle. Whoop. There we are. Hooray. I don't <laughs> understand that. Hooray. Now that we've finished congratulating ourselves for turning up, because Mel <laughs> didn't. Mel did not. Mel might Ooh. pop in later, capers. Uh, KB might pop out later. We're gonna give, we're gonna be very loose and flexible on this show, capers, because you know what? We're past the point of being professional. We we crossed that bridge a long time ago. But guys, Solo, a Star Wars story. What did we think? Eh. I think I can tell what KB thinks. <laughs> <laughs> eh. Eh. That's that is um. I, d- I didn't need it in my life. Um, I'm kind of sad that it was in my life, and now I just want to forget about it. Okay, Matt, what did you think? <laughs> well, again, it was I was one of those people where, where I kind of thought, well, do I really want to see a solo <laughs> and solo movie? And I was kind of thinking, no, not really. But um, I, I kind of compare and contrast to the last Star Wars film I saw, which was The Last <laughs> Jedi, within about a minute of that starting I said to myself, I've got a bad feeling about this. And within about a minute or two of this one starting, I was, I was going, going, oh, I'm actually slightly enjoying this. <laughs> um, it definitely wasn't a classic, but yeah, I was much more positive than I thought I was going to be um, about this film. And Christian? I mean, it's not good, but it basically works. It's a functional movie. <laughs> yeah. I, th- I think that's all we can hope for, that a movie fucking works. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it doesn't It has a beginning, a middle and an end, and there are some actors in it. Yeah. But yeah. Well, it shouldn't have, you know, for the, for the amount of money they must have spent on it, it should be a lot better than it is. But, but, um, yeah. but if you think about the kind of troubled pre-production it went through, it should be a lot true. worse than this. <laughs> yeah. But guys, yeah. there's something you should know. I fucking loved it. You heathen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Maybe That's fucking love is a bit. I. I mean. Okay. I really, really enjoyed it. I. I go into every movie I see, no matter how many things I hear about it, with like, okay, this is the movie's chance to impress me on its own yeah. merits, and this impressed me on its own merits. I know there's problems with directors, with research, with reshoots, with supposedly getting Alden Agra flag and Jeffrey Joe Rich. <laughs> getting a getting a acting coach but you know i think it came together could have been better yeah maybe i've got some notes i have some issues with this movie but you know what i think for what it is it was a pretty damn good outing i I found it enjoyable but no i didn't think it was I, i didn't love it i really liked the look of it actually all the various different kind of um planets you went to all felt like different places um but so the dialogue you're, you're telling me Kessel is not a natural planet; it's a large asteroid. Can I can I ask a question? No, Matt. <laughs> no, you can't yeah, ask a question. I guess anyway. Was was our screening broken, or is the film ridiculously dark and fuzzy? The film was really dark. Yeah, it's really hard to see at times. Really, some at some points it was dark. I thought I mean, there was quite a lot of places where there was lots of different kind of colours and things like that in it, though. Yeah, like the beginning. Yeah, but it was very it blue, was contrast, very dark, actually. and very fuzzy. I didn't uh, get right, that on I, my screening. Jeez. I didn't notice that. I mean, I some pe- some scenes were at night. 
but you know, that, yeah. that, that, that. or like in the uh, like in the various kind of bars that they were in. No, you know, those yeah. are quite dark scenes. The contrast um, was so bad in ours that I was tempted to leave and ask if there was something wrong with the projector. Uh, yeah. All right, maybe, maybe there was. was. Yeah. yeah, I didn't have yeah, trouble making out what was going on at, at any point in time. Ah, uh, see, so, you no, know, I did towards the beginning. I was a bit like, why is this so dark? I kind of get that if they obviously. And there was all the rumours about whether the lead actor could actually act. And I wondered if they tried to get away with that by making sure we couldn't see him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> dark in his name. I can so, see a vague outline of someone. He sounds like he was yeah, in a movie just... that we may have seen at some point. Was he actually been? Yeah. Oh, he was in that uh, Coen Brothers movie. Coen Brothers, yeah. At playing a bad actor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh God! But well, I, I, here's the thing: Alden Frankenstein Edge Rich's uh, I'm performance. I'm so glad you can't say it either. I, I, I can never. It's Alden Rich. Alden Rich. I can get the fucking. Are you saying someone's name or casting a spell? <laughs> Quite possibly. I I have summoned Frankenstein, the Destroyer. Oh shit! I was just trying to mention an actor's name. You accidentally summoned me, jeez. But no, he's the thing. I thought his performance was excellent. But I, most fine. of my problems yeah. are with the writing, so therefore I can't really. I mean, fair he was enough. Fine. And admittedly, admittedly, the movie does start with a piece of atrocious writing. So it starts off a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and I'm thinking they're not going to do the crawl this time. But then the mm. text they use for a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away continues, and I'm thinking, no. You don't do that. This is tradition, people. Come on, don't mess with that. But then it's just like the galaxy is in turmoil on the shipyards of Corellia. Street punks have to survive by selling this coaxum, this unobtainium bullshit, which feels like a drive. Whatever it's called, under the tutelage or under the control of Lady Proxima. And that's all fine, except for the fact that in the next like three, five minutes, we learn all of that ourselves. We really yes. didn't need that fucking intro. I was yeah, so glad the, you said film... that because that's exactly what I thought as well. It was within five minutes, everything that, that was in that introductory text we'd seen. But the film does that all the way through and it really annoyed me. And I know because I sat next to Mel that it really annoyed Mel as well. Every five seconds in a scene, they would tell you something that then they would show you in the scene. And we've talked about it on our podcast all the time, the whole show, Don't Tell. This film is so bad. It's show oh, and tell. Yeah, that's yeah, what I thought. Yeah, they're literally trying to hammer something home to you. They, it feels like the film is just trying to like shove like punched me in the face repeatedly just to be like, are you make sure you're paying attention to this bit? And I'm like, I, I know what, I feel like I kind of know what's going on in most of the scenes without them having to explain it. There'll be a the test is, later. The yeah, the thing is, I feel like I, I Please shouldn't... Please don't, I, I don't have no, a clear what's going on. <laughs> I, I feel like I, it's unnecessary to pick on a Star Wars film for being really dumbed down because that's basically what Star Wars is. <laughs> <gasps> Okay, okay, you're, it's, it's you're brave. Films. No, they're kids films. I was going to say, they will come for you. They're they not films, films for everyone, not kids' films. Cara and a Courage is a kids' film. We're not yeah, that's t- fine, but... Yeah. You know. oh, also, I've got another point out. Right, Corellia. I'm not as up-to-date on Corellia lore as I am with other planets, like, say, Kessel. But I'm pretty sure it's not exactly a shipyard. So as far as I remember, Kuat was more of a shipyard planet than Corellia. I think you're going to lose us there. <laughs> I have a feeling that... The um, yeah, that's right, it's Capers. It's... I've read the fucking books. <laughs> oh. I thought it was home to one, um, you know, kind of big shipbuilding company. That's what the uh, the kind of background law was. Uh, I was expecting more of like a kind of um, shipyard up in space kind of thing rather than the whole planet being a, a shipyard. Yeah, that's what I... Kuat was. That's how he had all, all the big... That's where they built all the Star Destroyers and small yeah. frigates and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah, but, I mean, we don't really care. The fact the shipbuilding thing is a minor thing. We don't really care about that. The fact is, it's just like, we start off with uh, Han Solo stealing a land speeder. Pretty good way to kick off the uh, film, I think, in a bit of a high axe chase, showing that he's a bit of a lovable rogue, a bit of a scoundrel. They're still trying to push this whole, like, dice thing that he hangs on, like, I guess... The yeah. Comic. Like, I mean, I swear, until... The Last Jedi, I had not seen those fucking things in a Star Wars film ever. Exactly. Uh, this is, 
they had they set it up in the last Jedi for a payoff that's going to happen in this film. So they yeah, had to keep mentioning it, right? Yeah, this is a big thing for me. This is a big thing for me. Okay, so this film is so much fan fiction. Like it's a needless explanation of every little minute detail of Han Solo. Yeah. Apart from those fucking dice that we don't know what the hell they are. <laughs> Everyone from The Last Jedi went like, oh, I wonder what those dice are. Maybe they've got a cool backstory. But no, we get a backstory about where he got his gun, how he met um, Chewie, how he met, what's his, uh, uh, how he got Lando, his name. how he got the Falcon, how he, um, how he got his name, got his, how he got his name. Yeah. But we don't find out what these dice, the one thing we want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's dice. Yeah. I mean, what? I mean, the only origin I could think of the dice was like he bought them in a shop. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is cool. It, they they did at one point mention his um his dad. Right. Um, I think he was talking to Lando, and he mentioned something about his father. So it's possible that he got them from him, but they didn't mention that. Oh, and, and yet, uh, and yet he, he didn't, didn't seem he's... to um get on with his dad either. They didn't didn't. And yet he doesn't have a last name. He gets given the name Solo by an Imperial officer when he signs up to yeah. the Imperial Navy. So, like, I ass- would have I assumed from that scene that he didn't know who his family was and that he didn't know who his parents were and that he had no surname. But if he did know his dad, like, was that when he was very young or was that someone who raised him but wasn't his biological father whose name he didn't have? But even then, why wouldn't he take this name? And it's, I, yeah, 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 we're getting bogged down. All we need to know is he goes to this Lady Proxima person who's this big uh, water snake lady person uh, <laughs> yeah. with his girlfriend, Kira. Kira, who I... Oh, I thought she was the, yeah, um, what is it, the caterpillar from um, Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Who are you? I'm Han. Oh, yeah, yes. And and it's... Um, barely explains, oh, there's a deal gone wrong. Oh, just do apologise. And then they steal a bunch of this uh, unobtainium, because I refuse to call it by its uh, actual thing, and... They embark in another high-speed chase. We just got over one. We're getting another one. Yay for us. And they get to Imperial Spaceport, and they're trying to get away. And it's like, well, obviously, they're both going to get away together. And then they get separated. It's like, I'll come back for you. I'll come back for you. I'd like to be an Imperial pilot, please. And uh, this is where it starts a big trend uh, in the movie, which is it's predictable as fuck. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I don't think there was a major plot point in this movie that I didn't see coming. Like smaller details of, were a bit of a surprise, I guess, and how things happen was surprise. But I could predict how most of the things were going to happen as they were happening. I've talked about this before. Mm. Is that only... because the movie is predictable? Or is it because I've consumed so much media? I don't know. But if you guys found it predictable, then maybe. I, yeah, I, there was, I was there was one thing that I thought was very surprising. Um. At which point I almost in the theatre said, what the fuck are you doing in this film? <laughs> I think no, I know, I think you know the thing yeah. I mean, right? Yep. Uh, it's kind of oh, like, yes. Oh, yes, I do. Yes. Oh, I oh, nearly yeah. forgot. Oh, thank you for my. Oh, yes. But <clears throat> nerdgasm. <laughs> but... My, see, I don't, I'm not invested enough in Star Wars and invested enough in the character of Han Solo to really, really give a shit about this film. So while I was bit of a problem, I constantly as I was watching it, I was kind of either kind of going, this film is way too obvious. It's really not subtle, and I feel like it was written by a five-year-old. To I have no idea who these people are. I have no idea what the hell is happening. Why is this film so confusing? To I'm genuinely so bored. I do not care. I don't care what is going on in this film. Why is it so long? We've said this on our show um, that we didn't know what the purpose of this film was because Han Solo has his story in the original trilogy and it's great. He's he's a great character. So we've said we don't know what the point of making this film is. And I still don't know what the point yeah. of making this film was. What what the purpose Ready? of his character. There was either it could have been like he was he was a good person and he lost his innocence. Which I kind of feel like maybe that's what they went for, but it, they didn't do it very well. Yeah. Or the incentive was just him being just a bad boy, which again, he wasn't. Even though he repeatedly said, I'm an outlaw, I'm naughty. And like, no, you aren't. Yeah. <laughs> no it's the Jack the Reacher thing all over again. Oh. I'm not the hero. Yes, you are. You're doing everything that the hero should do. Jeez. I, I, because, I mean, Hanzo, for me, he's not like sort of, he's a character that sort of wants to do the good thing in deep down but it's trying to be a bit pragmatic is trying to project this certain uh this certain persona in front of people but i don't know but talking about the writing it was written by lawrence kasdan who wrote empire 
and uh, I think I think what which one was it, it was um, the Force Awakens. But it's also written co-written by his son Jonathan Kasdan, and I don't know how yeah. old Jonathan Kasdan is, so maybe he is five years old. We don't know. <laughs> I just, I just um, yeah, I was thinking that um, bad script writing runs in the family. That's good, isn't it? Well, I mean, I like we all love Empire, but uh, in terms of the Force Awakens, uh, I didn't particularly like the writing in that because I, like... I thought the Force Awakens was fine. I have no no issues with Force Awakens or Empire. I just I have issues with this film. I've got plenty of issues with the Force Awakens, but I thought it was okay. It was the last one Jedi, Star Wars really... film at a time. Jeez, <laughs> we've got enough okay. here to deal well, with. What I was going to say about um, Han Solo in this is, if you if you watch um, A New Hope and you see um, the the point that um, Han Solo's character was at the beginning of that, when you first see him in the cantina, where basically you know he's kind of like, um, he you know he's a smuggler. He's definitely in with the wrong people. He shoots someone in public. Um, you know, um, without even thinking about it, really, before the other guy can draw. Because Han um, and then... shot first! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yep. But, um, but you know, if you imagine that guy there, and he, he um, and the first thing, you know, the second thing you see him doing is dealing with two people who are obviously, you know, really desperate. And he and he's saying, yeah, yeah, I need 10,000 all in advance. You know, he's not a kind of sympathetic character there, really. Um and if you have a, this film is supposed to be an origin story of him, but it doesn't get him to that point. The end of this film, the Han Solo at the end of this film is completely different to the Han Solo at the beginning of A New Hope. Ah, but you're forgetting we're going to have Han Solo sequels. So are we? I'm out. Bye We've bye. got to conclude Emilio <laughs> Clarke's storyline, I guess. Ugh, don't care. Uh, yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah, and uh, they, they've left it open for more sequels. They're going to... They're gauging the fan reaction because I think they're worried about the box office. Because yeah. the box office, I mean, uh, this film Isn't came great. out in the US on the 25th. And as of time of recording, on a budget of $250 million, they have got nearly $150 million. So, you know, just a... Mm. Not good, is it? Yeah. It could be better. Yeah. It could be better. So, Surely a Star Wars film can't flop. You wouldn't have thought that was impossible. Yeah, I. I, I mean, they they can they can. I mean, I think that no, I, I kind of think that even like the big major fans of Star Wars, none of them particularly were that excited about a Han Solo movie. When people were saying, "Hey, what about a Lando movie?" Everybody was like, "Oh, that sounds exciting. We don't know anything about him. Let's learn more about him." Yeah. And I know people that were just like, "Oh, Princess Leia story would be really interesting." Well, would it nothing... though? Because I mean, she she would just be basically like a kind of running around with the rebels, but also mainly just keeping up appearances in the Imperial Senate. So maybe you could have us like a spy thriller edge, though. I guess leaving a double life. Uh, yeah. Actually, you know what? Yeah, I'm sold. Princess Leia movie. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> I talked yeah, myself into it. It, it depends. It it's depends a, how a, much of a rebellion there's been before um, a new hope. If if you know it was kind of building for a long time, um, she could have been then there right from the start and kind of you know really involved with it. It was building for a long time, according of... to Star Wars Rebels. Uh, it started off with individual factions coming together to form a rebel alliance because it's an alliance of rebels, different rebel factions coming together. So she'd be part of one faction with her dad, Bail Organa, and uh, yeah, that would that would be uh, that would be interesting to see. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, kind they... of diplomatic spy edge that could work, I suppose. Yeah, yeah but... I think it's the fact that the more of the diehard fans it seems want those kind of movies than they did a Han Solo movie. But because we've got the Han Solo movie, some of the fans don't particularly. I feel like don't particularly want it, and then people that aren't that interested in Star Wars don't particularly want it. So I can imagine that it could potentially not do as well because genuinely no. That there's not that many people that genuinely want this movie. Well, you see, there's wanting a movie and there's enjoying the movie. I don't think many people... Uh, well, actually, no, I was going to say many people... Many, 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 many people wanted Dread when it came out, but they had a great fan reaction. So yeah. I, I usually... Dread is my go-to for comparisons for movies because I love fucking Dread. But it... I don't, I don't know. I think it's one of those things where... You might not want something, but when you get it, you enjoy it. You might be you might be sitting around your house thinking, you know what? I don't really want a biscuit. But then someone offers you a biscuit. And you're like, I would love that biscuit. Actually, yes. You know, it That's would have kind never... of the point I was at, actually. 
I kind of I didn't I didn't ask for it, but when it was on, I, I kind of enjoyed it enough to um get through it. I don't think I'll see it again or you know, like buy the D V D or anything, but um yeah, I was happy enough whilst it was on. Mm. I wish I just had a biscuit. <laughs> Sorry, I put that in your head. Do you know who else wishes he had, he had a biscuit? Han Solo, because he's been kicked out of the Imperial Flight Academy and is serving as an interim on a bit war-torn planet. And uh, that, that scene I thought was really fucking cool. The planet of the First World War. Yeah. Uh, basically, <laughs> basically, yeah. basically, yeah, because there's explosion stuff flying around and it looks right. The, uh, the cinematography, I guess, is really cool because it's all swinging around and stuff, but you can clearly see what's going on. I, I, just, I just thought it was pretty cool. And that's when he meets Woody Harrelson. Uh, I quite like that, actually. I quite like him weaseling his way into their gang. That was quite a good setup. Yeah. Yeah, yeah except for the fact that uh, he, he, he goes up to them and say, Hey, I've just figured out that you guys aren't really Imperial soldiers and officers. You're obviously criminals. I would like to be in your gang. Hmm, I don't know. Well, if you don't let me in, I'm going to sp- get you arrested. Well, that's going to engender trust between you two, isn't it? And then then they say, hey, this guy's a deserter. Lock him away. Wait, wait, no. Why would you do this? Maybe it's because you tried to blackmail them, you dunderhead. Jeez, maybe, just maybe, blackmailing the criminals who are undercover trying to steal stuff isn't the smartest thing you could do. Yep. Yeah, he's not he's not smart in this film. He says he was kicked out of the academy for having a mind of his own, <clears throat> probably because he was an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. exactly the sort of thing him in the academy though. Yeah. We've not seen what it was that made them kick uh, him yeah, out. W- Would that not have been a good uh, scene to put in? Yeah, cuz uh, cuz maybe it was genuinely like I think I could fly the plane the the plane the, the 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 ship this way. No, you need to fly it like this. Oh no, I see I'm doing better. Oh, you see I'm much better than you guys. Yeah, but you just made an order, so we're kicking you out. But when, what probably actually happened is, okay, so uh Han Solo, you scored really low on your last uh flight test. I'm afraid we're going to have to kick you out. Uh you just saying that cuz I have a mind of my own. No, no, we're saying you because you like blew up like three yeah. test drones by flying into them. <laughs> like, no, n- no, Han, you're, n- you're not as good as you think you are. But we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll never know. We'll never know. It's kind of, Yeah, I would have liked to have seen that. It's kind of like when you get in the first... Is it the first Star Trek film they made? The Kobayashi with, Maru. With, with Chris Pine, where they, were, where they had... The, That's that not movie. the first Star Trek movie they ever made. Do you know what I mean? The, yeah. the, the first one that I saw... The first one that you saw. Oh, we all know the first one that you sh- saw. It was three, the search for Spock, obviously. <laughs> uh, so that one, the one that I think is first, because it's the first one I saw. Yeah, um, one. There's a scene in that, isn't there, where, with Kirk, where he gets in trouble for... The Kobayashi Maru kind of test. Thing. The Kobayashi Maru test. That's the yeah. one. Yeah, the famous the Kobayashi test. Maru test. Sure, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Say it. <laughs> the boy. <laughs> no, <worries. laughs> no, I can't. Um, I think. Can't, uh, I mean, think the, uh, the lawyer from the Usual Suspects, and then I, I, um, the first part of Maroon. <laughs> I will say it if you say who plays Han Solo. I, I, who, who are you talking I, Alden to? Alden Eichen, Eichen, Flaken. Eichen, Flaken, Flaken, Flaken. Sorry, was that swearing in Yiddish there? <laughs> it's a flood, 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 flood. Who did you go? I'm doing the Swedish Chef now. Jeez. I was going to say yeah, Swedish Chef from uh, Muppets. No, that's the film I would watch. The Han Solo. What, the Muppets, the Star Wars story. Yeah, we've yeah. gone off on track here. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Sorry, but I would watch. We that. blew up the Death Star. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Speaker of stuff, stuff, small, or other time. Anyway, you'll never win, Maul. <laughs> oh no, he'd be C three PO. Yes, oh, he would. Yeah. For sure. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> and a bunch of honeydew would be R two D two, and they'd switch the voices. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, anyway. Uh, but Han Solo gets trapped in like this pitch with the Beast, and immediately, I th- well, as soon as they mention the Beast, I think, oh, that's going to be Chewbacca because this movie is yes. predictable. And then oh, suddenly, yes. we hear a growling sound coming from this pit area. Oh, it's going to be Chewbacca! A third claw hand comes out of the shadows. It's going to be Chewbacca, and it turns out to be Chewbacca. Yeah, like, they could have obvious, but I did like that as well. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, and, and, and Chewbacca is fucking vicious in this. Like, he throws him around like a rag doll. Chewbacca is giving no fucks. It's basically, it's a different actor this time. Uh, Junas, uh, Sw- I'm gonna look it up here. Uh, Junas Swatamo, a, a Finnish actor, I believe, who who's okay. replacing Peter Mayhew due to health problems. He was a body double in, um, uh, the Force Awakens and has since then taken over the role and uh, I, I think he did a great job yeah Chewie's too, too, fine yeah. no, no it's just a Chewie yeah I, 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 it's, yeah. it's Chewbacca and, and he's, he's, he's pretty bedraggled when we first see him he's very covered with mud and he's kind of uh, he's, he's looking a bit worse for wear because he's been you know held hostage and stuff like that and then I think they all... mentioned that they haven't fed him for three days as well oh god yeah so he, he is not a happy Wookiee and then and then uh, Han just starts speaking Shriwook. Where the fuck did he learn that? Do they teach Shriwook in the Imperial Academy? Were there lots of Wookiees on Corellia? We never saw any of them. Like Shriwook? What? Sh- Shri- the, the language of the Wookiees. Hard to discern, Kelly. <laughs> no, I know. I just thought the language was called Wookiee. Sorry. Carry well, on. The, well, that's like saying our language is human. Like, no. No. <laughs> Carry on, then. I'm learning. Well, mine's human. <laughs> Yours is human. No, all every time you hear someone speaking English in the movies, that's Galactic Basic, and there's various other languages, some of which like Rodian or, or something like that. But uh, Shriwook is the like, the beautiful majestic language of the Wookies, and uh, convenient then Han knows that I guess because they formulate a plan to break out themselves, which actually thinking about it, maybe. I'm surprised Chewbacca didn't come up with that himself. Like they break a pipe and they collapse the ceiling in on them so they can get out. I'm surprised Chewbacca didn't think of that. But anyway, and they uh, they they try and run down the the criminal gang uh, featuring uh, uh, what's it? It's, uh, Woody Harrelson, Tandy Newton, and John Favreau as this alien guy. Yeah, I'm surprised to hear that. I swear the, the 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 voice sounded familiar to me. That I later learned it was John Favreau, and they're like, "Hey, pick us up!" And Woody Hans is looking down, like, "Hey, they're the guys that uh, tried to blackmail me. Also, a giant fucking monster. <laughs> I'm gonna pick them up. Gonna give them a lift." Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it, this movie it's very plot convenient. Oh hell yeah! Oh yeah yeah. I have a I have a theory about that which we'll get into later I think. Well, I um, if, if we want to go go through the plot first and then kind of um, chop it to pieces. Absolutely, and um, they bring Han and Chewie in on a uh, on a uh, on their little uh, little plan for this little heist they got going. Before that, though, we get to have what every <coughs> Star Wars fan wanted: a shower scene between Han and Chewbacca. Oh that was my! So it's also important to note that absolutely nobody else in that army notices them escaping, knows they've stolen a ship, or in any way tries to follow any of them. Yeah. Hey, there's a guy and a giant Wookiee that are chained together running towards a ship shouting and screaming. Well, I'm yeah. going to go to the canteen then. doop de doop de doo Must be Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I, I... The uh, the shower scene actually really reminded me of... Um... Basic Instinct. No, no, a, a different one. The... Um... Uh, alien Covenant. Oh yes! <laughs> I was expecting like an alien tail to just come in. <laughs> oh yeah, that'd be the. And then the alien says, "Budge up, guys! I want to have a shower too." Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then they would have killed them both. End of film. <laughs> end of end of film. But they uh, they they get brought on this heist thing with involving a big uh, train thing. The actual logistics of the plan, I sort of tuned out. It got kind of boring and confusing. It's just like they're gonna do stuff yeah. and it's gonna be action oriented and fun. But we learned like uh, Woody Harrelson and Tandy Newton are are they married? Are they boyfriend and girlfriend? I- don't know that bit was so weird and so awkward it was a bit like let's uh let's sit, sit beside the fireplace for some exposition for a second yeah and then Fanny Newton is all just like telling the story of how she was in love with him or something and then they had to have the world's most awkwardest kiss it was just a bit like uh I've just I've literally just told the audience that we're together so now we have to kiss let's really, fulfill really... our obligatory on-screen kiss <laughs> exactly it was so like 
there's no chemistry like between them. It's so weird. Yeah. Do you know what yeah. was good though when Chewbacca was talking about how he wanted to find like his tribe or his family because it's all under slavery, and it's just like a little, little bit, and it's it's a little quiet moment, and it was actually rather sweet. I thought. I thought the stuff, the the kind of relationship between um, Han Solo and Chewie was um, the kind of strongest of the kind of inter um, character kind of um, interactions. Uh, much more so than between him and Amelia Clark. Oh yeah, yeah. They're, they're... I kind of I kind of believed that these were the two people who kind of um, were starting to become friends and starting to trust each other and kind of figure out that the only two, the only other person that they could really trust was you know the other uh, one rather than all these other people around them. Doesn't that come down to the fact that we know that Han Solo and Chewie are going to be friends in the future? We know how great their relationship no, they... is. But I think there's an element. We particularly of care about Kira because we know that. It, the, the the love story we're supposed to be rooting for for Han is for Han and Princess Leia. So do, does, do we particularly care? I said this to Christian when we came out. I said the, the whole idea of putting in Kira as a sort of a love interest and they were brought up together doesn't really make that much sense to me because it just makes her like so expendable. You know that they're not going to get together because... They're not gonna like their love isn't gonna last a lifetime because we know where Han Solo is gonna end up. So surely they could have just done it that that they were like best friends or something because there is this like shocking idea that I don't think Hollywood realizes. But like women and men can just be friends. They don't have to be romantic. The idea of uh, having a, a person out there in the galaxy that was brought up in exactly the same place as you and that you were you were brought up together. It's a strong enough connection for him to want to go back to say to find her, without having to be all romantically involved. I think that's that, a... that wasn't why I didn't care about her. I didn't care about her for quite a lot of other reasons. Yeah, oh, okay. I kind of didn't like her she as a boring <laughs> as I mean, a character, and yeah, she wasn't really very interesting. That's the. Uh... Oh, okay. Well, that was the reason I didn't like it, so I'm just getting I mean, out of it. I mean, I, I think you make a very good point, but I always think, like, it's the uh, journey, not the destination. Just because we know they're not going to get together doesn't mean that we can't enjoy ourselves. We know that the Titanic is going to sink, but that doesn't mean we can't have fun while we're there. <laughs> but, uh, we're watching them die. <laughs> <laughs> watching them die. Yay, that guy hit the giant fan thing and now he's dead. What fun. But uh, we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, Tandy Newton dies. Uh, well, I was, was going to say actually, I was going to say actually, sorry um, to interrupt, but this is as good a time as any to, to jump in one of the points that I saw. So I'm obviously aware of the production uh, chaos, and one of the complaints they had that they it was that Lord and Miller were making it too funny. Oh God, yeah, which I'm glad they hurt. circumvented because that's a complaint I had about the Last Jedi. Well, as as a comedy writer, I I could spot watching this and seeing where the jokes were meant to be, mm-hmm. and I'm pretty sure this was one of them. So Chewbacca has his 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 sort of speech. Yeah, and then it in some way gets misinterpreted. It doesn't get doesn't get. Um, there's there's, a, there's a, just definitely a joke point at the end of that, rather than making it sweet. That I'm assuming they've changed. There's a few. There's like quite a lot of spots in this film that there could have been a joke, and then it just suddenly just kind of stops instead. Oh uh, right, yeah. Um, which almost feels like it was taken out in editing. Uh, mm. Line, yeah, space for quips and things like that. Um, which, which I, I really should just make. I mean, need to watch it again and just make a list of them. I can remember a few off the top of my head. Um, but I mean, like seventy percent of the movie was reshot or done by Ron Howard, but that means there's a thirty yeah. percent best part left by it was Lord and Miller. Who's I would have liked to have seen the Lord and Miller version. I kind of feel like having a a quirky, quippy kind of Han Solo would have been a bit better. I think that there was a moment at the beginning, wasn't there, where he had like a rock or something and he was making the clicky noise and things. And I kind of think yeah. that that might have been something that was from a draft that they did of making him be a, the kind of person that would just, like, he, he's constantly just trying to find his way out of problems. But by doing so, you can do it in a kind of, a, like, a sort of funny way. I mean, yeah. I, I, think, I, think that... I think the jokes that they kept like that were enough. Because I do, I do have a problem with a lot of movies, and this is especially the Marvel movies, putting too many jokes in because that's what people like. Like, that's fine. And there are times we absolutely... Uh, movies where you could absolutely put in a lot of jokes. But you need to... I think it needs to be more balanced. And this felt, in terms of the tone that they were going for, in terms of the balance of the jokes and the comedy, felt right. There were plenty of jokes in there for me to enjoy and plenty of serious moments for me to enjoy. So in that regard, I'm satisfied. Yeah, I, did, I didn't 
I didn't come, go from it thinking, oh, God, that should have been a lot funnier. Or, no, or no, that I, I came out and no, thinking, oh, there were too many jokes in that either. No, I didn't either. No, I think they got the I balance didn't. well. I'm just saying I could... I was aware, because I was thinking about it, that I could spot yeah. where the jokes were meant to be. There's a joke <laughs> yeah. meant to be there. There's a joke meant to be there. Oh, I get it. Uh, so mm. I'm not really thinking about it that way. But I just think that if the, if the humour came more from the character of Han Solo, being that kind of character... As long as the humour comes from characters, which is what I kind of feel like it does with Marvel films and it didn't with The Last Jedi, I kind of think that that, that works to have Han Solo as... Because it kind of makes him feel more human because I kind of feel like humour is a kind of a human... Yeah, and it, and again, in the original trilogy, that's very much what he was like. Yeah. He was making well, jokes you know, to, was... not to amuse the audience, but to amuse the people around him and kind of you know get rid of the tension of the situation, that kind of thing. I think he made um, a few, but I don't think he made that many. No. Uh, he wasn't very quickly at all in this. But the, the one thing that the guy's name that none of us can say did get across is that kind of that cocky nature of Han Solo because he did come across quite cocky and know-it-all at times, which I'm kind of thinking is possibly what they wanted from the character of Han Solo. That's what I wanted. Yeah, I kind of think that sometimes he really felt like Han Solo and other times he really didn't. It was a bit hit and miss for me. Mm. Well, better, better anyway, it's a miss than just miss, I guess. But maybe it was sending the yeah. bar too low. <laughs> the bar, yeah, the bar was pretty low. So, I mean, I, I have no issues with his his performance. I don't really have any issues with any of the performance particularly. I just think it's the writing. I kind of feel a bit sorry for some of the actors having to say some of the dodgy... Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, well, let's, let's, get, let's let Scott get on with the plot because this, I wanted to interrupt partly because this is the point where the film starts to go downhill for me. <laughs> I <laughs> like it. It goes downhill with here. the death of Tandy Newton to which Woody Harrison does not seem particularly distraught. Like, she gets blown up and I, she blows herself up, actually. I kept on thinking, like, I'm sure maybe she could figure out a way out of this. She doesn't seem like the type to nobly sacrifice herself. And he, like, closes his eyes, her, his eyes, and like, no. And then she never gets mentioned again. Well, she does, mm. because Paul Bentley says that he's sorry. And I was just like, sorry, oh, Paul yeah. Bentley cares. Yeah. I mean, Woody Harrelson doesn't, and he was apparently married to her. But Paul, at least Paul Bentley cares. I like Paul Bettany. Let's you mean, you mean Paul Bettany? Paul Bettany. Actually, Actual Paul Bettany. I don't mean his character, but I mean like actually yeah. him. Yeah, no, no, I know. I thought he said Paul Bet. I thought he said Paul Bentley. I thought who's Paul uh, Bentley? No, <laughs> Paul Bettany. <laughs> I think the idea here is though, and it's communicated very badly, mm. is that she does this because Paul Bettany is going to have like a fate worse than death for them if they don't if they don't get this. Yeah. Uh, I think that was the idea, but that's not communicated well at all. No. It's really not. And also, again, with the film being really obvious, that one line, which I think is Sandy Newton, where she just kind of goes, oh, it's a good thing that only we know about this job. As long as the like space pirates don't know, then we're okay. And oh, like, no, oh, space pirates! Space pirates are going to come. <laughs> So it's that, it's just, it's not subtle at all. It's just like, it'd be really bad if they turned up. And I'm like, right, how long until they turn up then? Damn it, Tandy, you had to say it. Yeah, that's it. Oh, God. And so things go a bit pear-shaped and the John Favreau alien dies, which I was, I was, I was very sad. It gets drawn out a bit. It was, it was actually kind of sad. I, I like that character. Yeah, um, only one of them needed to die, though. It didn't need to, two of them was overkill. Uh, possibly, yeah. But then again, then I guess that means that they can focus on building like the Han Solo little team with Lando and all the others, but also focus on the burgeoning mentor-mentee relationship between him and uh, Woody Harrison. They also can't have two women in the same scene at the same time. That'd be crazy. <laughs> oh God, yeah. Oh, oh God, uh, yeah. When are we gonna get a Mon Mothma movie? <laughs> Is it Mon Mothma movie? Oh, geez. And uh, t- see, it turns out when the whole thing goes pear-shaped because uh, Han uh, blows up a mountain. Yeah. And it turns yeah. out he's uh, Beckett was uh, hired to steal the shipment by this guy, Dryden Voss, played by Paul Bettany, who is a member of the Crimson Dawn Syndicate that could have existed in Star Wars before now, but I've never heard of them. And I was kind of hoping they'd yep. use an existing cartel like the Black Suns or something. But... I don't know, maybe they thought it'd be too similar to Blue Suns from Firefly. Who knows? Mm. I was hoping that a big Star Wars fan would know what the hell was going on with Paul Bettany and the Crimson Sun and who he was. But 
Obviously, they've just made it up, right? It has no connection to the Star Wars. The universe. problem is, we've got a new it's canon not now. Though. Yeah, so he, he, he's the head of a criminal gang, and he's got people above him. That's not. No, it's I, not a I, difficult thing to understand. I I get it, I get that, but it's just the fact that because they kept mentioning him before you saw him, I kind of wondered if he was playing a character that Star Wars fans would know. I don't know, because there's two different canons now. There's the old canon, which was good, and the new canon, which I don't know that much about, but I can safely assume is shit. So, uh, <laughs> so I don't know. Some he... of the old canon was good. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love, the old, I love the old canon. The old canon is great, like with Kessel, which was an asteroid, not a planet. I'm seriously upset about that. So I don't know why I'm getting so upset about a planet, but fuck, fuck Kessel. And um, basically... Uh, ha- he, Jaina Voss is not a very happy bunny. He is defo going to kill uh, Han and Chewbacca and uh, uh, Woody Harrelson. He, the problem with Woody Harrelson's character name is that it's Tobias Beckett, which is like the most ordinary R uh, sort of reality name you could possibly think of. Like Luke Skywalker, yeah, Luke is a name, but uh, Skywalker, that's. Skywalker, that's, that's yeah. It's like it's like having a guy in the Star Wars universe called Bert Smith. Like, oh, Peter. Oh, hello, I'm intergalactic space pirate Bert Smith. How are you doing? Well, it it kind of reminded me of Thomas Beckett, who was a kind of medieval Archbishop of Canterbury, <laughs> and it's kind of like that's a really kind of <laughs> different look at the Star Wars universe. I know it's a long time ago, but surely <laughs> the ga- galaxy far, far away would. Oh, Wookie, know, what heresy is this? Yeah, oh, God. <laughs> But uh, Han manages to bluff his way into uh, stealing from Kessel, like the uh, unobtainium from Kessel. I guess he just knows that there's a lot of unobtainium on Kessel. Um, um, I have a feeling it was, wasn't he being given hints by Kira? Wasn't that the kind of oh, the yes. setup from that? Because Kira, it turns out, she isn't on Corellia anymore because Han Solo this whole time has been going on and on and on about he's going to buy a ship, go back to Corellia and find her. No, it turns out she's in the employ, or is she a slave, of the Crimson Dawn and working like there's the right-hand woman of uh, Dryden Voss. And uh, it's a it's a very interesting uh, reunion between the two. It's like It, it felt, very, felt very reminiscent of the reaction of two very good friends or people that were in a relationship who have been separated for a long time and aren't quite sure how to act around each other because they have have been apart for three years yeah she's moved on and he hasn't yeah it's 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 i thought that was kind of interesting and um and and you talk about how you didn't really buy the relationship and i think that's because of this distance i think that might have been on purpose because imagine if they just gotten back together and things had gone back to normal the second they met up again that would have been a bit too easy i think mm. yeah it's kind of mentioned or, or hinted at that she's gone on this whole different kind of um journey to him that's kind of hardened her in oh yeah a, oh no <laughs> yeah wait she keeps on going like throughout the movie whenever they have a moment together she's like you know you don't understand i've done really bad things horrible things motorbike things and, <laughs> and oh, I thought that was a T-Rex there for a second <laughs> uh, but, but here's the thing here's the thing what things what has she done has she killed I... people has she had people killed has she sold people into slavery has she committed genocide has she sold drugs what has she done she keeps on saying oh I've done so many terrible things and I was waiting for the scene in the whole movie like with the revelation like that some of the awful yeah. things she's done just to survive and that's why she's become too much of a different person for her to ever go back to the way things were with Han but we never get that scene we'll yeah. get it in her story the Kira Solo, Kira Solo movie. Yeah, yeah, it's... Uh, we'll, we'll, a prequel to this. Yeah, <laughs> a prequel. Oh, no. Like a companion piece, like a midquel. Oh, God. A midquel, Jesus Christ. Yeah, we got prequels, sequels, and midquels. That's the nature of Hollywood today. Despair. Interquel, isn't that the... Interquel. Interquel, even better. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a whole thing. And we, we, we just never get that. And it's... I get the, the kind of... The building up to this sort of morally flexible, really uh, actually darkened, very changed uh, version of Kira, as opposed to the light, happy and sunny version that we knew for all of five minutes at the beginning of the movie. And it's, 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 they never took it that, that step enough. They never took it far enough. And 
I, I, I don't know. It probably doesn't help the fact that it's uh, Amida Clark, and when she's Khaleesi, when she's Daenerys, she can be very uh, stern and imposing. But when she smiles, it's just like, oh, come here, Amelia Clark. She's so goofy and adorable. <laughs> and that's not really what uh, what Kira, I think, was supposed to be. Like, like I, she's a yeah. very good actor. But I did. I think she was possibly, possibly, and I'm willing to be proven wrong on this, miscast. Yeah, I think of um, Amelia Clark. Her um, agent is really good at getting her television roles and really bad at getting her movie roles. <laughs> Terminator <laughs> like Genesis. Terminator <coughs> Genesis and all that kind of thing. She's, she's been in some badly written films. Yeah. Oh, well, that was a that was a yeah. uh, uh, Me Before You movie, which I actually kind of liked. I oh, did watch it. Yeah. I feel like there's a whole plot line, though, that would have made a lot more sense if Han had chosen to leave her behind rather than had to leave her behind. Like, mm. if there had been a tough choice and then their relationship's strained because of that, because he he might not have had much of a choice, yeah. but he could have, like, well, I can help you or I can run away, whereas the choice was out of his hands in the end. Mm. I think that would have made a lot more sense. You should have gone and used about this movie, geez. And, uh, and so Han proposes this uh as opposed an alternative to dying uh this uh proposal of stealing from uh castle to dryden voss and dryden voss is like you know what you guys failed spectacularly before but i'm gonna give you another chance and also for some reason which i cannot fathom i'm going to send my le- lieutenant with you kira oh and by the way if you will fail you'll all die including you kira for some reason i've just decided yeah. to be mean to do for some reason despite the fact that in every other scene i've pretty much been very nice to you and very supportive of you like Okay. <laughs> it's Weird managerial the stance, the last half of the movie, and he knew that they that she'd need to be there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Blood convenience. Jeez. And... I kind of liked his character though. He had that, that weird sort of touchy feely thing, like, "Oh, I'm I'm just here to care for you. Don't worry, I'm your friend." Kind of thing he had going on. Yeah. Very nurse. I, I there's something there that worked. Yeah. I I, I think Paul Bettany was doing a really good job. Uh, got lots of cool scars on him, which I like, and. Uh, we see we, we, the very first scene we get with him is him uh, stabbing like the imperial governor of the planet they're on in the chest with like, his, like I think it's a vibro knife, and uh, yes. well, I should say that because vibro blades don't usually have an energized uh, edge blade to them. You, they usually just have a cortosis weave, which means they they're, they're sharp, obviously, but they can do a lot of damage. But I so I don't know. I need to Wikipedia that shit. Pointless scene though. That was a pointless moment. Like we know he's the villain. We've been told yeah. many times that he's yeah. the villain. We did not need to see him stab a character we don't care about or even know who they are. No, not the Imperial Governor whose name we don't know. The movie isn't <laughs> the same without him. Oh god. Oh my god, boy, he's so evil. He stabbed a stabbed an extra. Oh god. god. <laughs> yeah, and uh so and in, or- and in order to get to Kessel, they need to pass through the Moor, which is like this, uh, this shopping center. This big, sh- this big shopping center. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a nightmare, especially during like the Christmas rush. Jeez. And um, in order to do that, they need a really fast ship, which I guess Dryden has no access to. So they go to this other place, uh, this other planet, to buy or to get a ship from Lando motherfucking Carizian. And, oh, God, Lando Carizian. Oh, yes. Yes, Donald Glover. Yes. Oh, it's everything <laughs> I hoped he'd be. Yeah, sure. I, um, I, I liked him, but I didn't... I, I, everyone I um, heard talking about this film said, oh, yeah, Lando Carizian's the, you know, absolutely brilliant. The best, best thing kind of it, thing. Yeah. And I kind of looked at him, well, you know, he's quite good. I didn't, I didn't kind of think he was absolutely amazing, though. Well, well, maybe not, but uh, for every scene that he was in, every line that he was in, I, I really enjoyed. Thought that is Lando Carizian. That is, well, yeah. They, yeah. Got, they got, they got what I think Lando Carizian is, which is a very charming guy, but ultimately he's just as much of a scoundrel and a renegade as Han Solo is. The only difference is he wants to appear respectable and he wants to reinvent himself and be like sort of like a Renaissance man. So I think yeah. they got that down. So they clearly understood the character and Donald Glover. I mean, I'm going to go, I'm going to go and say it. It's perfect casting. Yeah, I, I, I think like he that he talked casting. them into breaking his ship out of um, yeah. lockup. But I'm not clear why he needed them to do that. <laughs> like, it felt kind of like him and the 
L3 probably could have done that. Oh, L3. extra people. I, was I the only one that thought that L3 looked a lot like Alpha from fucking Power Rangers? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. you're right, actually. <laughs> yeah, now that legs. I mean, I prefer L3 to Alpha easily, but then I prefer, you know, uh, being waterboarded to Alpha. Fucking Alpha. Ugh. Hate Alpha! Hate, hate, I, hate, I, hate! I was really disappointed in L3 because I think uh, Phoebe Waller Bridge is great. I mean, I've seen Fleabag and I just think she's a genius. Oh, I, I, just, I, I saw that. I uh, saw the first episode of that ages ago and I thought it was shit. It's, it's, Really? Oh no, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. It will have you crying by the end. It's so well done. But I just didn't I just didn't like her in this film. No, I didn't at all. No, L three's terrible character. She had such terrible dialogue. And I just because Mel isn't here to tell you about this, I am going to share the story. Um, because sat next to Mel while watching this film and there's a scene between her and Lando in the spaceship and he goes, Oh, is there anything I can get you? And she went, Equal rights. And Mel went, oh, fuck off. <laughs> yeah, a lot but of the dialogue is very up, on the nose. Pretty much sums up uh, that kind of stuff for me and Mel. The best description like, of her oh. is, um, I've seen, is someone called her Me Too D2. Me too. Oh, I like that. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Yeah, she, yeah, she's I hated very, her character. Well, I was she's, so yeah. happy when she died. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Because, I mean, she's very into... Uh, robot rights and droid rights and uh, yeah, different yeah. Rights. and I don't know I kind of liked it but there's not too much to her character beyond that there's a bit of a scene between her and Kira where the, mm. I guess it's like a girl talk uh, and uh. and uh, talking about how Lando's in love with her but it could never work between them and that's pretty much it so all we know about her is that she is fanatically obsessed with uh, freeing droids and uh, I guess has a love interest. For it, just, it. So, so, it just feels uh, yeah. like. Um, are there, are there like any? Are there any women in this? It, it feels very talking, but also like that's the another female character that has a love interest. It's so, like two main female characters, both of which yeah. have sort of love interest. So, which means I think the only female character actually no, there's three. There's another one. There's another one, but we'll get to her uh, later. Uh, so I mean I I kind of like the character, but I could get why other people might not like to her because it's not the most subtle yeah it's, re it's really not subtle i can kind of imagine the father and son kind of writing team just kind of going hey have you seen what's happening in the world we really Look need how to woke write. we are we need to exactly that is literally it we just like it wouldn't be so great if we actually got this 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 car this robot that's all about like female empowerment and equal rights and robot yeah. rights but, but the there's film a very early okay, sorry, there's a very early episode of future armor called fear of a bot planet which is essentially the exact same storyline. Um, yeah. Bender kind of goes on this big um, campaign to for they get they go to a planet run by robots yeah. who blame humans for everything as, kind of, as escape as a scapegoat. <laughs> and Bender goes on this kind of um, thing to get to for robot rights, but really he's just trying to get more time off work. Yeah. And there's a moment in that where he's talking about well, what do you think? Do you think? So he says something like, what do you think, that the machines are just devices designed to make humans' lives easier? And Fry says, well, aren't they? And Bender replies, I've never made anyone's life easier, and you know it. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically who L3 is. She's that yeah. moment from Futurama. It, it, it seems to me I, that sorry, this on. idea that basically the droids in the um, uh, Star Wars universe are essentially slaves because they are set up to have, you know, kind of um, sentience and personalities and all this kind of things. But they are kind of like sacrificed, um, you know, without thought. They spend their entire lives kind of, you know, serving people and things like that. And that's actually quite a um, like a Kevin Smith. You, if, if you could imagine him kind of riffing on that kind of thing and writing that kind of stuff, um, which is I think is what they were trying C3PO to do. C-3PO is my slave terribly name. Terribly written. I it's mean, also really, really stupid. Like the bit we're jumping ahead a little bit, but when they're on uh, on Kessel and they're, 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 she's freeing the other robots. So she's got there's all these machines that basically are there to press buttons and move dials, and so she frees them by removing this AI inhibitor restraining bolt, restraining bolt off of them, and like oh now you're free. Well, first of all, why do these machines have AI? For what what reason would you need to give a machine that just is there to turn around and press buttons? AI. Do, are computers inherently have AI in the Star Wars universe? Yeah, actually, yeah. You could and have if, just had a big computer yeah. do all of that, couldn't you? And if they do have AI, why do you need to restrain it? Just remove it. <laughs> <laughs> They're machines. 
You can have like a one of those bobbing ducks that you put water in to press a <laughs> button. <laughs> Yeah. You, you, so you're sort of cool. unraveling the fabric of the Star Wars universe right now. Yeah, well but are machines We've... born in the Star Wars universe like Transformers? Is that what we're supposed to believe here? They probably made. So. Oh god, yeah. You give I me think... something to think about now. Oh god, it's terrible. Like, right? yeah. yeah, it would be. It would be interesting if Lando was genuinely in love with L three and L three was genuinely in love with Lando, and then you had. A relationship in the Star Wars universe that was just a, a, between a man and a know, robot. Well, it's, it's hinted at, and this is something I want to talk about actually. Uh, Lando's sexuality. It was asked to uh, Jonathan uh, Kasdan was asked what is Lando's sexuality, and he said that he's got a fluid sexuality, which some people yes. interpreted that he's a uh, pansexual, which uh, some people have we responded can stay out to. Of my kitchen then. Yeah, which some people have responded to very positively, and some people have responded to very negatively, accusing the movie of like queer baiting. What are your guys' thoughts on this? Um, they, it doesn't seem out of character. If no, they showed but, it in uh, the I film, don't really care. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I, you know, it didn't really problem. come up in the film, so it hasn't really been um, established one way or the other. Who, um, who is Lando be... sleeping with has not been on my brain since I first saw A New Hope. That's yeah. <laughs> or where everyone, no, he's not in that one, is he? He's in you um, say that, it's been on my M1. brain, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> it's all you can think about, Scott. It, 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 it consumes me. It truly yeah. does. But, go on. I think my, my issue with that is that it's, it's one of those things that quite a lot of films do, where rather than just have a show us a relationship with Lando and him being pansexual, him having a relationship with a man or a woman or flirting with a man and a woman and a robot or whatever. Rather than do that, it, they just don't really put any of that in the film, but then in the press they kind of go, oh yeah, by the way, he's pansexual, as though they're being like groundbreaking to include it, but they have no proof of it in the film. It needs to yeah, come organically um... from the film, not just use it as a marketing tool to get people to go see it. Yeah, they don't examine it in the film. They don't, you know, whether or not, you know, his sexuality is unusual in the Star Wars universe. Or but that's the thing, you see, I think the like... Star Wars universe is one of those universes where it wouldn't be commented upon because this is a universe filled with every sort of alien species you can think of. And as far as I'm aware, concepts like ethnicity, species, uh, gender identity and sexuality aren't the hot button topics that they are. Uh, in our reality, sadly. So I, I think this is one of the things where it wouldn't necessarily be commented upon, but that doesn't mean you couldn't show it. Like, it would have been interesting to yeah, see... Yeah, but you have to show that it's not being commented upon in the film. Otherwise, yeah. it's not part of the character. It's just something that you've, you know, kind of, like, painted on after the fact kind of thing. It doesn't... Yeah. It doesn't. Um, it, it's it, a Dumbledore! It, it, it doesn't... A Dumbledore, it, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't affect the way the character behaves or interacts with the world and the rest of the story... So it doesn't matter. It's not important at all. But, I mean, that's that's I... kind of my um, take on it anyway. But there was a point where um, Kira and um, L3 were talking about, um, uh, well, basically, human robot sex. They, they said, you know, oh, is that can that even happen? And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, that can happen. And it's kind of like, oh, right. And for me, I kind of thought, you can't just drop that and then leave it. <laughs> I want you know, details, L3! Don't, 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 in the film or you have to explore it in some way because it obviously shocked Kira. Yeah. What you I know. want is a shower scene between L3 and Orlando. <laughs> oh no no, no a ghost bit. scene. Oh my love. <laughs> my darling. Exactly. <laughs> there is a good bit between them in that regard though actually that I quite remember where they're they're in they're in the um the pilot and the co pilot seat and she says something like my joints uh need need oiling or something yeah and she looks at him and goes you're gonna have to do that thing again tonight and he and he just kind of looks cringes. at him and goes oh okay <laughs> yeah like, that. like these guys obviously got, there's, some, there's something odd about this relationship here but it kind of you don't need to know any much more it's, about it it's but, odd yeah, but it works they have a very i think they had a lot of chemistry actually and I, it, the, 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 the the scene where he tries to save her before she dies and everything I was actually, I was a little bit choked up about that. I thought that was rather you sweet. more than Woody Howson did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, fucking right. And I wish that she had, uh, well, not live because she's a droy, but uh, continued to exist, as it were. Uh, and so it would have been a great juxtaposition between for the, their relationship, Lando and L3, as opposed to Han and Kira's relationship. 
And actually said, like, yeah, yeah, you know what? We're a guy, we're a robot that's really hammering on about equal rights. But you know what? We make it work. Yeah. <laughs> I can't get over the fact that I was so, so happy when um, she wasn't in the film anymore. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. And I like, and and I like Phoebe yeah. as well. So. Yeah. Well, see, what, like what, happens, oh, what happens I like, is... They, I, like, oh. I like the actress. It's like, oh, what could have been, you know? Yeah, but it's, what happens is they go to Kessel and uh, Han and uh, uh, Chewbacca are sort of carted in as mock slaves whilst Kira and L3 and... Uh, Woody Harrelson. Beckett. Beckett, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Which seems in... like a really terrible plan that shouldn't have worked. Yeah. Yeah, but... Uh, but they didn't have time it, for it. It doesn't. It doesn't <laughs> work. to get to the next scene. <laughs> yeah. And it turns out that uh, Kira has got a few fighting skills of her own. She knows Terrace Casey, which is I thought was a great little Easter egg to put in there. Well well done. You referenced a terrible video game. Good for you. And Terrace uh, Casey sounds like a, another Star Wars name. That should have been Woody Harrelson's character's <laughs> name. <laughs> it's, it, yeah, it's a much more Star Wars. It's the name of a martial art that uh, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, actually. But uh, yeah, it sounds like a guy called Terence Casey, as in like T E R R E N C E C A S E Y. Actually, thinking about it, I, I'm pretty sure that's not how you pronounce it, but I can't look that <laughs> up. I'm not. Yeah, jeez, and. Um, so things are a bit pear-shaped. Uh, Chewbacca sees a bunch of Wookiees that are slaves, so he has to go and free them. They get the unobtainium, which, due to plot convenience, you know, oh, if it goes beyond, like, uh, a certain temperature, then it'll explode! And they all get it onto the uh, the ship. L3 dies, gets shot to pieces. Lando is a bit distraught about that. Goes into fucking Saber like a badass. And, um, and I kept wondering, like, the Wookiees that they meet... Uh, are they Chewbacca's family, or are they just random Wookies? I felt like they, the one of them might have been his family because there was a bit more of an emotional moment, or at least the film was trying to tell us it was a bit more of an emotional moment between him and one particular Wookie. Mm, but uh, again, we but don't have, we don't have, have enough context. A female Wookie, we, you know, we don't know. <laughs> but maybe, That's maybe. What after that as well? Did that star destroyer just go down and kill everyone, or just re-enslave everyone? Probably, yeah. Um, I don't know. What actually? What happened to those Wookies? Did they? Yeah, they're still on the planet. I guess everyone they? they just got stuck there, or they could get killed or re-enslaved. There's no reason for them anything else to have happened. They could have gone on the Millennium Falcon. They could have dropped them off somewhere else. But no, no, they they just get left behind, and uh, they they have to go through the Kessel Run. And this is the point in the movie where I thought, okay, how are they going to get around the whole parsecs being a unit of distance, not time? which is a mistake in the first movie that they've kept in now because it's so famous. How are they going to make the Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs? It turns out it means they usually there's a specific channel through the moor that they have to go through that's safe, but there's a Star Destroyer in the way and TIE Fighters, so they can't do that. So they have to go through the dangerous bit full of like uh, gravity wells and space vacuum monsters that they've got to get and through. Cthulhu. And yeah. Cth- fucking Cthulhu, yeah. <laughs> And uh, it's a pretty cool scene, actually. And it and it does what I was so hoping this movie did. It establishes how the Millennium Falcon front bit looks. Because they eject the <laughs> yeah. escape pod. And I, was, I, and I saw, when you first see the Millennium Falcon, it looks shiny and new. And it's got, like, this sort of uh, a more intact front bit. Because in the... In the uh, Millennium it's Falcon, got a two-pronged bit in the originals. And it's and it's all one piece in the in this one. Yeah, and so they have to get rid of that... And and when it, by the time it gets out of the moor and makes the castle run in less than 12 parsecs, it looks like the Malayan Falcon we know and love. And by this point, Lando is really not happy with Han. It's just like, I hate you, man. And, and Han's always like, you love me. And I keep on thinking, like, I buy this, but I don't. Like, this doesn't feel like how their relationship should really kick off. At the same time, it does. I have very mixed feelings about this. Yeah. Hmm. But they go to this other planet. I refuse to learn the names after the fucking Kessel debacle because it's an asteroid! It's a, Like, seriously, uh, you can, this is so easy to look up! There's this thing! It's like Wikipedia, but for Star Wars, it's called Wikipedia, and it has all the information you need! It's got everything there, and it's got a fucking picture of Kessel about how it's a large fucking asteroid! It has been featured in multiple books talking about multiple things about how it is an asteroid, and fucking video games and shit like that! It's there! It's there! And you just made it a planet! What the fuck? 
It's this isn't some obscure tiny bit of trivia. Everyone knows that Kessel is an asteroid. I mean, Star Wars isn't that good at keeping up with its own lore. Yeah, even. <laughs> that's a, that's that's as maybe, but I still it, it's it's a bugbear of mine. I do apologise. They go to this other planet. They get the uh, unobtainable cooled to a certain degree, and are basically uh, waiting for. Uh, it has to be refined, isn't that the point? Yeah, it has to be refined and processed because it's raw unobtainium yeah, that they that got. It, yeah, because uh, they they need to make things more actiony and put a time to they on it, I guess. And um, they're waiting for. Well, time. having said that, sorry to interrupt, but having said that, we never actually really establish what the time frame is. It's like at some point, this is not this is going to explode. Like, I mean, I guess, but there's nobody was... like we have. We have to be quick. We have to do this quicker and quicker. And like, well, like I, and then they yell on the planet, and they're like, <clears throat> unload. They just have. In. They just have Woody Harrelson. They said, they said if it gets something like 35 degrees below standard, which implies to me that it's getting colder over time, which is a weird thing to happen. But you know, never mind. Um, but then they never have a like a much of a monitor showing you how cold it is. Yeah. You know, if they had like a like a digital thermometer counting down as it or counting up to. You know, whatever thing it is. They just have Woody Harrelson better. checking on it every now and then. We see that it's changed slightly, but which which, which we have no context for whether that's good or bad. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what, what he's looking for. He's opening it up and seeing whether or not it's exploded and killed everybody. <laughs> <laughs> nope, nope, we're still, still here. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, yeah. But, well, what's he going to do? <laughs> but uh, when they're on this <laughs> planet, know. they're confronted uh, by the, the uh, space pirate marauder person, Enfis, whatever her name is, who uh, tracked them to Vandor. And there's a pretty funny scene where Hanzo is like, okay, you can try and attack us, but there's like 50 armed mercenaries in the Millennium Falcon. And they're going to, oh, Lando's flying away. Oh, shit. Oh. Yeah, yeah that's quite a Han Solo sort of joke or funny character moment. That was that was one of the things where he's qu- he seemed more like Han Solo. Yeah. And th- yeah. this is when the movie uh, really starts to lose me, actually, because... Uh, this person, this Enfys person, takes off her helmet, and there's a weird moment between her and uh, Tobias Beckett, and I kept on thinking, like, are they related? Are they hinting at a previous relationship or something? Because they have like a little moment where they stare at each other, and like, like what's their deal? Like, I it, thought she kind of looked like the um, the woman of, who was in their gang before, who blew herself up on the bridge. Actually, I, I was wondering, oh, are they? Is that her daughter or something like that? And I it's kind of like. Oh, that's what I that's thought right as up. well, but the, the movie never establishes any kind of relationship. They never talk about it, so I'm. It I mean, was who knows? Weird just, moments. It was. It was a weird, weird moment. But then she reveals that actually they're not pirates; they're rebels, and they're trying to prevent the Onoptanium from going to the Syndicate and therefore going to the Empire and gaining more power. And for some reason, which I cannot fathom. Han agrees with this, despite all the shit he's gone through, despite the fact that he really wants to make a deal with Dryden, he uh, he sort of almost immediately agrees to the plan and decides to uh, trick uh, Dryden Voss. And admittedly, they give him a sob story about how the Syndicate did horrible things to the people of the planet they uh, they've gone to and stuff like that. And uh, it's, I'm pretty sure Han could have figured out that the giant criminal empire that had threatened to kill him were bad people. I don't think he needed any convincing on that part, really. Yeah, yeah it's like, Espe- it's like especially Paul... after they stabbed that extra. Yeah, it's like Paul... yes, yeah, exactly like that. Paul <laughs> Bettany stabbing that bloke. We don't need this establisher. We know the empire and crime is bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And surely that Han, I think what um, he was saying, though, surely that Han knows that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not a surprise in universe. But it's an but, immediate... Also, I think Han agreed to it, though, because he's not a good guy. See, that's why he agreed to be the good guy, because he's not a good guy. I yeah. to establish his character. He's not a good guy. He just does good things all the time for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, yeah, also... without exception. <laughs> yeah. But also, it, it leads to something... So something too, too stupid between him and Beckett. Because uh, about midway through the movie, I think when they, after they meet up with Lando Carrizan, he's like, don't trust Lando because you can't trust anyone. That's how I survive, by not trusting anyone. And immediately when he said that, I thought, well, he's going to betray him at the climax, isn't he? Yeah. It, it, it's so obvious. They might as well have flashed yep. it in neon letters. Just like, he's going to betray him. And I thought like, oh, or he maybe. Could have looked at the camera and gone, wink, wink. Yeah, <laughs> but, exactly. But this is the thing that's easy. Because of my stupid, uh, skeptic brain, I kept on thinking like, well, maybe, maybe 
they're going to turn on the head. Maybe he's not going to betray him and it's going to be someone else that betrays him. And it's going to be like, hey, I thought you said you shouldn't trust anyone. And he's like, yeah, well, I've never been good at following my own advice or something like that. And so maybe yeah. something like that, they could have turned his head and done a bit of a switcheroo. But no, they just do exactly <laughs> what would be so obvious. And... Um, and it goes into a big confrontation between uh, them and uh, Dryden Voss. They try to give him a bunch of uh, fake on Obtanium, but it turns out Voss has been alerted to the treachery by uh, Beckett, and uh, then they send a bunch of soldiers to get to uh, Enfys and the space pirates, but uh, Han knew that uh, Beckett was going to betray him because he basically stated to him to his face halfway through the movie, and so uh, he's actually got the real I, this is the point where the, yeah. at the, at the movie was just like can we just wrap things up now like, yeah exactly yeah this is it, the why is this film still going moment yeah <laughs> i had that but way before this but yeah this it's is supposed to be like a kind of triple cross you know kind of mexican standoff um kind of thing a bit like the end of um um what's that uh, quentin tarantino film reservoir dogs reservoir dogs yeah I can, I, I can only think of Pulp Fiction, but it's not in that film. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but that's what it was supposed to be. But, um, yeah, it's just kind of taking a bit too long. Although I did like um, Beckett's thing where he, he kind of like pulled out his guns and shot all the guards and then and yeah. um, then said, oh, sorry, I'm just thinking, but I like to be the only person holding a gun when, while yeah. that happens. I, that was quite a cool moment, but... Yeah. Um, Little things, but then he, like, he takes Chewbacca and the unobtainable and makes off of it and uh, leaving Kira and Han to fight Voss. And Kira ends up uh, killing him. And and then she says, OK, Han, you go and get Beckett. I'll be right behind you. And I'm th sitting there thinking, that's a fucking red flag. That means she's either going to die yeah, horribly yeah. or she's going to betray him. And it turns out it was door number two. <laughs> yeah. I, I was surprised, actually, that um, on the way down in the lift... Um, Chewie didn't rip Beckett's arms off yeah. like he did with that other guy in the lift yeah. who had a gun on him. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, why the hell did Chewie go off with Beckett, you know, rather than saying, oh, you know, actually, I'm, not, I'm kind of with Han Solo, who's been m a much better friend to me for the, the entire um, thing. It's also lucky that Han Solo can run at 50 miles an hour yeah. and get ahead <laughs> of them. How did he get ahead of them? Space yeah. magic, the force! The force. <laughs> He forced himself to do it. No, no, he. it's the same way that he managed to make the Kessel Run in less distance than the Kessel Run is. Yes, yeah. <laughs> he went through um, the planet. I just, yeah, I feel like the film was already falling apart for me. And I just think that it got towards the end and it just, it just felt like it was kind of rushing through so much stuff that it just got stupider and stupider and stupider. And because of the fact that the film is not, was never subtle at all, it generally meant that I kind of rolled my eyes so much in the conclusion for this film, especially with moments like the big reveal of some sort of character when that girl took her helmet off. And I was just like, cool, who's who's that? I don't, I don't know what's going on. To all of the... It's like that scene in Justice League... Un it's like that scene in Justice League Unlimited where Lex Luthor swaps bodies with the Flash. <laughs> and it's like, I think I... Oh, well, now at least I can find out the Flash's secret identity. Takes off his mask, looks himself in the mirror. I have no idea who this is. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, oh my God, it's some random person. Exactly. And it's so, it's so weird. It's kind of like the opposite of that whole thing with um, Ben Dick Cumberbatch playing Khan, where he's like, I am Khan. And we're just like, yeah, we know, it's fine. Yeah, that was so obvious, despite the fact that Khan is supposed to be Indian and was previously played by a Mexican person and now he yes. is played by a white guy. Fucking that was so stupid. <laughs> yes. But uh, yeah, so it's that. It was kind of like a reverse of that. The film was just like, oh my god, this person's taken off their helmet, and it is somebody we don't know. Well, no, what that know? was, what that was, so, is it was just a terribly dated trope. So what the idea was, you took a helmet off, and you're supposed to go, a girl. Yeah. <laughs> oh god, it is. Oh my god. Oh, oh fucking! They tried to put a Samus around on us. Yeah, I was just but they're like like, like yeah. two decades too late, if not three decades. That's exactly what that was, yeah. Yeah, it's three decades, That's... mate. We're, we're much older than you. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> admit to yourself. <laughs> sorry, sorry, but uh, God, yeah. It's, uh, but there was another big reveal. It turns out the person that Dryden Voss was working for all along was Darth Maul. Re really? 
I mean, yeah. I don't care. <laughs> okay, I mean, okay, so Darth Maul has been featured in expanded universe content for quite a while now. He's been in uh, featured in uh, the Clone Wars TV series and Star Wars Rebels TV series, shown to have survived, got himself a met- metal legs, been played by Sam Witwer, who, is, who does a great job of that, and also I think the mocap was done by, or at least the body was done by uh, uh, Ray Park in this one. And, it, and, it, and I mean, um, I'm fine with it, but like, out of all the characters you could have used to reveal who is in charge of this criminal empire, Darth Maul isn't the person I would have gone for. Like, I'm not, I'm fine with it. I'm sure they're going to go in an interesting way with it. However, there are so many characters in Star Wars Lexicon, I feel like that would have been much better for that. I don't know. I, 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 uh, it's, yeah, I mean, it's. I, I didn't realise that these, um, you know, Red Eclipse guys or whatever it was, um, were evil until I saw that they had Darth Maul in charge. Of yeah. Them. <laughs> yeah. I think possibly what they're setting up is that Kira may become a Sith. That that could be what, um, you know, kind of what they're going for here. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I didn't get that. Because don't forget, in a, in a New Hope, Han is very dismissive of the Force and stuff like that. So I think minimizing his interactions with something that's related to the force would be prudent but uh, who knows who knows and it's just like it's not a bad reveal it certainly made me gasp but at the same time like you, you can tell it's gasp because it's a character that we haven't seen in ages and it's a fan favorite that they put in because is a fan favorite yeah yeah much. um guys I, I have to go <laughs> oh no Oh no! And we've almost finished too. I do apologise. Well, thank you very much for turning up. That's all right. Um, but yeah, I just didn't like this film, so that's it. <laughs> well, while you're gone, we'll give it a ten out of ten rating. <laughs> so yeah, well, yeah, you you guys obviously liked it a lot more than me. So we have varying yeah. degrees here. I think yeah. it, I think it goes you, me, Matt, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think me and Mel are definitely on the same page for this film. We both kind of hated it, really. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's it. Don't worry, there'll be plenty more sequels for you to enjoy. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Have a, have a fun time. Speak to you guys soon. Bye. 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 Great, she's gone. Now we can enjoy the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, the thing about this, the, the, the more reveal as well, is... It's almost when he like he grabs his lightsaber and switches it on for no reason at all. I felt like that was almost if to go. By the way, in case you didn't recognize the face, here's the double-ended lightsaber. Yeah. I am Darth Maul. <laughs> just yeah. to clarify. Do you get it, yeah, people? Essentially, he would be like sitting in a, a space phone booth or whatever, wouldn't he? Yeah. So it's kind of like, yeah. Why does it? All the people around him would go, "Why did you turn your lightsaber on?" <laughs> and Kira... or maybe it was like that um, bit from the Last Jedi where they're talking to. Um, new yoda woman and she's kind of like in the middle of a battle kind of thing oh yeah maybe that was the idea that was so weird oh god yeah it's like we got to cram this character in because people love that character so much i can't remember her name the only thing i remember that character is that she's played by lupita nyonga mm. that 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 and she it. apparently has a camera following her around everywhere yeah apparently yeah uh, but but here's the thing though. Uh, Kira uh, talks to Maul and says, "Okay, so Dryden Voss is dead. I killed him, but I, and I am going to be working for you now. I'm taking over his criminal enterprise in your name." And Maul is like, "Okay, sure, yeah, I'm fine with that. Like you you killed a great asset to me, but you know what? Sure, I like you. I you're a real go getter, Kira. I, I like." She didn't. She didn't say that she killed him. She said he was killed by the people who hired who he hired. Oh, so he did. And, I misremembered. And then and then he then he said, "Oh, he he was killed by one man." And she said, "Oh, I don't know. I wasn't there." Oh. So um, she's kind of like you know she was lying to him. Yeah, and I feel and like realized she was evil until the lying. Yeah, I I feel like this was a good reveal that didn't have sufficient build up like again the whole talking about oh i've done terrible things this could have built up to the revelation that actually she's become just as much as a criminal she's no longer an innocent victim she is now just as bad as dryden or at least it's on the way to becoming just as bad and is ambitious and power hungry and that the whole movie we never really got that hint we just got her a bit of a distance between her and han and her saying she's done the things and uh, it's just it, it didn't feel earned and it, it, it the setup was lacking 
Yeah, I have a kind of a, a, a couple of things to say about the, the, this film in general. Um, I think what happened with it is, um, you know, you know, kind of right at the beginning of a project, when you get everyone around the table and you say, right, okay, I want to hear everybody's ideas for this. This is the point where there are no bad ideas. Just throw in everything, and then we'll kind of sort out the best bits later on. It felt like they'd done that with all these kind of things like um, saying, oh, we need to know where Han got his um, pistol from and where he got his name from and where he got the Millennium Falcon from. And oh, wouldn't it be cool if we had him in a kind of like First World War situation or if we had him in a cantina or if we had him on a, you know, like a train heist. And they threw all these ideas in. And then instead of sorting through and getting the best ones, they just left them in. Um, uh, yeah, if, again, it's going to like bit... so many different scenes and kind of tones and things like that all the way through, which at first I liked because it meant we were getting kind of, you know, a big contrast between the kind of the, um, you know, all the scenes. But after a while, it just became exhausting of, the, of all these kind of changing directions. Yeah. And like I said, with the um, when they're at the Kessel um, thing, the scenes were quite short. So the plan didn't really go wrong because there wasn't enough time in the film for it to go wrong. They needed to get onto the next scene and then the next scene and the next scene. It and what happened with a lot rushed. of these things is um, possibly when they changed over the um, directors as well, um, they kind of lost a lot of the, um, the connections between things being set up and the payoff. There was a lot of kind of widowed things that were being set up and never had a payoff. And a lot of things like with Kira's kind of, you know, um, journey that were that had the payoff, but they didn't have the setup. And it felt like that all the way through with these uh, with a lot of things like that. Mm. I, if it is uh, throughout the movie, like it felt like often it was just going from action set piece to action set piece. And there was stuff in between. Yeah. And stuff going on as well. But it, it there was an element. Where I thought that like, this doesn't feel rushed. But it feels rushed. It feels like we're rushing yeah. to something. And turns yeah. out what we're rushing to is Han killing uh, Woody Harrelson with like a quick draw because Han shot first. And uh, with uh, Kira's big yacht ship flying off and him refusing to join the rebellion when Emphis asks him to. And... Then he goes and he wins the Millennium Falcon in a game of Sabacc with uh, Lando, stopping him from cheating. And... I think that shouldn't have happened at all. I think they should, the film should have ended with, with him, especially if they're going to do more of them, the film should have ended with him without the Millennium Falcon. Yeah. And then you would have been like, oh, holy shit, now we need to find out how he gets the Millennium Falcon properly. But, but, what, a better ending. The, but what I would have liked was if you kind of cut out about half of the ideas from this film For and, sure. and focused on and developed the ones that were left better so like the idea of this of where he gets his um custom pistol from that could be a much more of a story than oh just the the guy he's after gave, gave it to him after about five minutes you know or the um or the idea of him winning the millennium falcon in a card game which is which wasn't invented for this film that's always the, been the story i played um, sabak in video games and like the knights of the old republic video games it's a real established game yeah, yeah, but that's what I mean. Uh, but you could have established this rivalry and kind of, you know, kind of like friendly interaction with um, Lando much more if you, if they were always playing card games against each other and, and you know, kind of like vying to get, um, you know, to get the upper hand sort of thing. Um, or or his, like his piloting skills, you know, basically what his piloting skills were mainly was kind of flying through a kind of grey cloud with a few rocks in it. Yeah. yeah. And it's kind of like, well, okay, that's that's fine. But we could have seen much more with of, you know, like him developing the those kind of skills and why um you know, why he was such a great pilot, that kind of thing. Um so it's yeah, established kind of that he's a good pilot. Yeah. He just was because he needed to be. Yeah. Yeah. Again, and there convenient. wasn't time enough for him not to be yeah. uh, oh, because we needed thing, to get to the next scene. Because the things with the set pieces and getting his pistol and the Millennium Falcon, it's just a window dressing. It's the look of Han Solo, not the character. You take away the Millennium Falcon, take away his pistol. He's still Han Solo. And so uh, you, that, that needed uh, more focus. And the movie ends on uh, how it was always going to end, I think. With uh, Han saying, "Oh, a, a big crime boss on Tatooine is setting up this uh, crew together for something or other. Let's go get it. What's this guy's name? It's Schmabber the Schmutt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the movie sort of ends like that. And it's just like the whole movie for me felt like it was trying just to get Han Solo to that point. To get him with the pistol, get him in the Millennium Falcon, get him with Chewie. 
and get him getting working for Jabba the Hutt. It was all just a rush to bring the character uh, up to speed, almost. Yeah, and the, the thing I want to know is how 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 much time is is between the end of this film and the start of A New Hope. Probably not a lot because I'm. I'd say max thought, ten years. Yeah, because I thought that um, at the beginning of A New Hope that. Han Solo had been um, with Chewbacca and um, the Millennium Falcon for quite some time. Mm. He hadn't just obtained all this kind of stuff. It was kind of set in in that place. Whereas from this, it seems like he's just going to go on, go and meet Jabba and do that smuggling um, job where he had to kind of get rid of the cargo. And that's why he's in debt to Jabba. So that could be like a few months between the end of this and the start yeah. of A New Hope. It doesn't, it doesn't gel very well between the... Um, the end of this and the start of the next one for me. Whereas something like Rogue One, the end of that one connected really solidly to the beginning of A New Hope, I thought. And there's also the question of Maul, because uh, in terms of this new canon, if we're to take the Star Wars Rebels TV series as being canon, he, spoiler alert, dies on Tatooine confronting Obi-Wan Kenobi. And it's a bunch of stuff he went through before that. So it, it, it's difficult because the timelines are all sort of weird. But it's it's also like, well, OK, so now that we've got Han Solo in the duds with the belt, with the Bagan, with the Millennium Falcon, with Chewbacca, like now can we actually uh, develop his character? And we've got to wait, yeah. for the, wait for the sequels, which honestly, at this point, it's a 50-50 shot of whether we get any sequels. Yeah. I mean, I said this at the, the beginning. I don't know what the point of this film was. Like, is he supposed to now be a bit jaded because Kira buggered off. Is that, is that the idea here? Is he now yeah. more cynical? Is cause I don't understand why, what the that, point it should be, but he's not, it's not, no, you know, that's, a, that's why I said he's not, he's nothing like he is a, in a new hope at the end of this film. I mean, he said, um, he said, Oh, I'm not going to join your rebellion in this one, but he's just given them like 60 million credits worth of, uh, you know, starship fuel. So he kind of is part yeah. of the rebellion, really. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not like it's not like he's kind of like staying out of it because he's bad for business kind of thing. He's he's made quite a huge contribution. I think because mm. I, I, that part though, I did kind of, I did kind of like because I mean, that's very much Han Solo. He's a guy who wants to project this image of like oh, I don't care, I don't give a crap about stuff but he, he kind of does, there's a small part of him that does care, that's why he sticks around with the rebellion for so long and yes there's a point where he's trying to leave but he really can't due to circumstance but also it's just like you know what, he could have buggered off at any point but he chose to stick around or he made up excuses to stick around and so that small last bit I do get, because like, okay, I'm a bit, a bit unfair to the movie because his character does get developed, but that's sort of like a minor thing compared to, again, getting him the gun and the Lamb Falcon and all this window distress stuff. They're much more concerned in this movie with the aesthetic of Han Solo as opposed to the character. The character development is there, but that wasn't the priority. Yeah, mm. it's the it's the brand recognition of all those uh, of all those things. Yeah, all these characters, like with Lando, it's very easy to it's very easy to say to um, a kind of um, you know production company, oh, well, and we'll show how he gets his gun and how he gets the Millennium Falcon, than it is to say, oh, and we're going to go go into his character as to why he's a uh, you know why he's kind of a bit jaded or. And it's weird because it feels all crammed in, despite the fact that they could could I presume they could allow to just make as many films as they want. It's the Star Wars franchise. Why would they? Are they worried they wouldn't be allowed to make another one? Yeah. Well, here's kind of the like thing. With, here's the with, thing. Um, um, a lot of with people. With Batman v have... Superman. Yeah. Oh yeah. Got where me. they have basically crammed about five films worth of material, including like you know Batman v Superman, the death of Superman, and all these kind of other things just shoved into the film. But I found this was more enjoyable because at least there was you know kind of like different colors and interesting places and things like that going on, rather than just kind of the kind of relentless grey and brown of. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Because oh, this is a fun movie. I had a lot of fun watching it. The acting and the action scenes, the performances, and I guess the general plot was fun. It's its, its own worst enemy because there are points where it just drags itself down. But there's also parts of it where it actually seems like this is just such a fun ride. And I think we can attribute a lot of that to Ron Howard because he's very good at making fun movies that, you know, are decent, have a strong foundation. 
So, because I mean, let me put it this way. He's a guy who maybe liked all the fucking Da Vinci Code movies. And those, I mean, <laughs> geez, geez, come on, guys. That, that, those movies are stupid, but they're a lot of fun. So, you know. Yeah, I think that's the kind of the point I'm um, at with this film. Is while I was watching, I was going, oh, you know, this is quite fun. That's, you know, it's, it's a kind of bit of a, 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 you know, a romp kind of action film. But it doesn't, I. If you, you know, you'd want more out of, uh, you know, like a Star Wars film and, you know, quite such an important character from the Star Wars, um, you know, canon than just a bit of a kind of, you know, fun messing around. I will say at least unlike the the prequel trilogy, it doesn't cram in anything, any references that don't need to be there. Mm. Like, I'm sure that a George Lucas version of this would have had C-3PO and R2-D2 as droids that get freed on Kessel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and honestly, the references are very minor here and there. Uh, one of the best uh, bits that I love was fucking Warwick Davis! Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was in it, yeah. Almost forgot. Finally gets to play a, like a human being rather than... Uh... <laughs> well, well, he did in uh, episode one. He, he was featured in that, and apparently it's the same was character. It? Yeah, I think he seemed like the pod race or, or, or Naboo or something. And... Uh, yeah, right, okay. Yeah. I don't remember that, but... Yeah, I mean, he looked a bit younger then, but uh, it, yeah, it was just so cool. Cause like, yay, Warwick Davis, because I love him and he can do no wrong. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's the problem. It's I like this movie. I do like this movie. I genuinely though feel that I don't like it as much as I could do, and I like it a lot. I I really enjoyed watching it, but as I say, it's it's his own worst enemy, and the stuff putting him down. Part of that may be due just to the nature of the film. Part of that may be due to the trouble production. But I think it's one of those things where I've always said that you can't look at a movie in a vacuum, but at the same time, you kind of do at the same time because you've, you've got to look at it and its own merits. And I think on its own merits, Solo, a Star Wars movie, does hold up. It's currently got a 70% on Rotten Tomatoes, which I think is fair. Like, any more would be like, eh, but any less would be like, eh. Um, are we, so what, is, what are we saying for our seven uh, out of 10 score? Which is the average point? Oh, see, 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 on the show, I, I don't really do. Uh, I I usually just refer to Rotten Tomatoes, and I don't really. Oh, right. okay. I don't I don't really like to give numerical uh, scores to movies because I think, like with any work of art, there are shades of subtlety to it that makes giving an actual. I mean, if you want to give it like a two thumbs up or two thumbs down or whatever, that's fine. But for me, I'm more comfortable just saying I felt this way about it. Yeah, that's what we do as well. I would say it's a fi- if it, if I was looking at it as a score, I'd say it's a fifty percent for me because it's just it yeah. basically works, but it isn't good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I th- yeah, I, th- I, think- I would be a little bit more generous in that. <laughs> I think I because I, like I say, I did in, I did appreciate all the kind of um, you know like the cinematography of it, the fact that we got kind of um, it felt like more of a universe with lots of different places and they you know seemed interesting places you know. Um, so I, I, but yeah, it didn't, it didn't have enough kind of weight behind it. And um, like I say, there was, it felt very kind of choppy and, um, and, and, and uh, kind of shifting from one thing to another without enough time to develop any of the ideas that it had come up with, even though some of them were actually quite interesting. I would have liked to have seen them sure, yeah. do more with it. You know what it's like? It's like a roller coaster when you're whizzing around and having a good time, but occasionally like, uh, when you go along the roast coaster, you pass by a billboard that's advertising like this really bland and bo- like bran flakes or something. I don't know. And it's just like, well, I mean, OK, but why can we not just enjoy the roller coaster or at least like, have some variety with the roller coaster? I, I don't know. It, it's a fun ride with this is a it's a flawed movie, but I think it's worth your time at least once at least. I mean, if you're a Star Wars fan, for sure. I think, I think we've established I'm a Star Wars fan. Like I know Wars. the language of the Wookiees. We've established I'm a Star Wars fan. <laughs> it, it didn't feel hugely like a Star Wars um, film to me. I think if you could, if you kind of just changed a few of the cosmetics of it a bit, like the people's names and have um, Chewbacca being, you know, like a kind of a Yeti rather than a, a Wookiee oh, yeah. and things like that, you could have easily made this just a kind of generic um, science fiction or science fantasy, really, film. Mm, but this, if we weren't the, talking about this with you, Scott, on the on your show today, um, I probably wouldn't have bothered to see this film, and that would have been fine. Oh <laughs> dear, I've been alright with that. Well, yeah, I, I don't know if I would have either, actually. Um, it does seem to be pretty. Like, I, I wasn't. I wasn't unhappy with the film. Yeah. 
problem is they couldn't have picked a worse time to release it because it just came out after Avengers and Deadpool. And this is the sort of uh, late May. It's the time when the blockbusters come out. But uh, those are two very big films that were sequels and big cumulative things to already established franchises. Whereas Han Solo Star Wars movie, the very nature of this movie is that it's standalone. It's solo. And so there's not, people aren't as invested in it as they would be in Infinity War or Deadpool 2. They're only invested in it because of the character, but this is a new act playing it with a younger spin, so it's a slightly different character. So it, it the movie had a lot of stuff going against it. Mm. And I, I think I, time will tell whether or not it turns out at all decent. But for what it's worth, I had a good time watching it. It got me in a bit of a scoundrelly uh, sort of mood. Maybe you want to actually start playing that fucking uh, Star Wars MMO, The Old Republic, and actually start playing that because I'm scared to. <laughs> God, it's a... I mean, I've seen The Last Jedi, and that... That, yeah. So you know, it's, it's not going to be the worst film I've ever seen for sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. Uh, don't get me started. Now, uh, I, think... I kind of I would say that I had more fun with this film than I had um, with um, the Force Awakens. Oh God. But yeah. um, but that's not that's I a very think... low hurdle, guys. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I I think I I liked Rogue One more than this. Hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I would say the opposite. I, I, I guess I kind of enjoyed Rogue One, but I enjoyed this one far more because uh, it felt, if again, it felt more fun. It felt more uh, like a, like a interesting journey that I wanted to go on. And the fact is, I did connect with the main character, whereas in Rogue One, I didn't connect with uh, Felicity What's Her Face's uh, Jyn Ursa, whatever her name is, character at all. She was just sort of there, just sort of a blank, saying, "Hey, I'm a rebel. I rebel." Okay. Uh, meanwhile, Han Solo. Did she even say that in the film, though? Uh, yeah, yeah. Possibly, so much got changed in that she movie. She definitely said that in the trailer. Yeah. yeah. But I don't think she actually said that in the um, film, did she? She was an unfortunate weak spot in that film, though. All, hmm. all, the, all the characters in that were unfortunate weak spot. Like I didn't really care about those characters at all. It was, it was kind of interesting to see what happened with the Death Star and all that sort of stuff and the tone they were going for and the set pieces. The only character I really liked was the Alan Tudjik robot. But, uh, and this one, I connected with the characters much more. It's flawed and the, the development, you could argue, has a lot of issues. But I connected with Han. I connected with Chewie. I connected with Lando. I connected with Tobias Beckett and with even with uh, L3 and the uh, John Favreau alien. Like I liked these characters. I want to see where they ended up. Less so Kira, but you know what? Uh, still pretty cool. And so even if you could say that, you could say that the character that you liked the least, you still kind of cared about a bit. I think that's something. And I think there's something to this movie. Not for everyone, Kaylee and Mel in particular, but still. Yeah, see, I didn't really connect with any of the characters that much. Ah. Um, so possibly that's why you, you found it more enjoyable than I did. But um, but yeah, I, I still I still kind of had fun with it. But um... Star Wars does rely on a lot of nostalgia, just in yeah. general. And we don't have that. I don't, definitely don't have that. And we don't really have it on the show in general. We don't have connected to the universe. So, well, I, for, for yeah. me, see, uh, I'm, I'm, I think it's safe to say I'm a big film guy, a bit of a film buff. And that started with Star Wars. I was like seven years old watching Star Wars for the first time. Set me on the path where I am now. And it's only grown. I've read a lot of the books. I've got the fucking books with me right now. I've got like the Thor Thrawn trilogy, the Grand Apple Thrawn trilogy right next to me. Head <laughs> of the Empire, Dark Force Rising, The Last Command. I'm I'm reading right now the uh, Coruscant Knights uh, books. I played lots of the video games. I has watched Star Wars Rebels and the Clone Wars. So it's safe to say I have a lot yeah. of investment in Star Wars. So my reaction to this movie isn't going to be the same as someone who's more of a casual fan or someone who isn't that familiar with it. So I do understand that. Well, mm. I watched A New Hope last night and I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Which cut? Kind of Which cut? Oh yeah, that was, Which I version? I, I love this kind of thing. But I felt more like, um, uh, you know, connecting more with Han in that film than I did in this film. Mm. It felt more like the kind of, you know, sort of wisecracking or you know, kind of roguish um, sort of space smuggler than than I, I feel he did in this one. Yeah. Well, time will tell whether or not this actually goes somewhere, and I kind of hope it does. One person, though, that doesn't is David Malofsky Capers. He has written an editorial 
called You Don't Actually Like Star Wars. <laughs> I'm going to provide a link in the show notes. Check it out. I've read it. I'm not going to say I agree with everything he said. We've talked about this before, but I do think it is worth a read and worth because he makes some very interesting points. And so we'll provide a link to that. And I think on that note, we're going to end the show. Uh, Christian, Matt, thank you guys very much for joining me today. You're more than welcome. Yeah, it's been fun. And thank you very much to Kaylee, who turned up, and Mel, who didn't. Yes. Oh, wait, sorry, are we saying thank you for Mel for not turning up? <laughs> no, 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 no. no. no, no. That seems pretty harsh. <laughs> She's part of you guys. No, no, I don't know. I, I just... <laughs> We're professional, guys. We're so professional, honestly. Oh, God. And Capers, don't forget, we're still doing this our, uh, email sign-up list, uh, Comic House giveaway. Links in the show notes. Or you can eat comics. Sign up for that. It's, it's really worth it. And if you enjoy the show, please tell your friends. Shout it from the rooftops. And if you haven't already, go back and listen to some of our over super episodes, like our last uh, Jedi review. And you can listen to the show on iTunes, Podbean, YouTube, or at podcapers.com. We've got a Patreon, check out the rewards, patreon.com forward slash ap2hyc. If you want to get in touch with us, suggest show topics, or maybe you want to come on the show yourself, show yourself, we can find us on you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at ap2hyc or email us at podcapers at ap2hyc.com. Thank you very much to Dan Harris for our logo, the lovely microphone, the red and blue 3D glasses, those are mine. And thank you for listening. This has been Podcapers, the official podcast of a place to hang your cape. Punch it, Chewie!